Hey guys, welcome to The Gun Shot with me, John, and we've got Nick Horton here today to talk about the great Colonel Hawker. For those of you who don't know who he is, I'm hoping by the end of this we're going to give a concise view of a few of the things he did and what he's famous for and um, what life was like back then in, in wildfowling terms. So, to start, he was born on the 24th of November, 1786, uh, in London. Yep, he was born in London. <clears throat> he came from a very wealthy family. Uh, and again, in those sort of um, looking at this from a socio-economic point of view, again, because the, the, the value of money was different then to what it is today, he, he would have been part of a, of a wide strata of society, but in modern terms, he would have been a multimillionaire. Indeed. Um, he inherited uh, a large uh, estate at Long Parish in Hampshire, which is still there to this day. He's not far away. No, um, great fishery attached to it. I indeed, uh, in, and in fact, um, inside the house, uh, sadly they don't do tours for this because it's a private residence. In his diaries, which we'll come on to in a minute, he actually mentions about one of his early punt guns blowing up, exploding at the breach, and then actually got the gun in there, st stood up in a in a, in a door frame, you know, fixed to the door oh, frame. Oh wow! It, it's still there to this day. Um, but yes, he went to Eton. He did. Um, another researcher pointed out this fact, which is that we all kind of uh, associate Eton, and especially me, since I went to school part of my um, for, for my secondary education in Windsor, yeah. which of course is right next to Eton. So um, when we were playing rugby and rowing etc very often it was against Eton College um, and you will know that the upper class for want of a better description often speaks speaks with a certain affectation of accent um, it, it's it's reckoned that when Hawker went to Eton that that was not the case they, they took their uh, pupils from uh, a broad section of, of society and the plum in your mouth, back of your throat, uh, upper class twit accent had not yet been invented. I just want to defend those who have a and slightly more upper class <laughs> accent. And not that they're <laughs> communists like me. <laughs> um, but he, it's, it's quite likely that Hawker actually spoke with a rural uh, West Hampshire accent. Really? He was probably a bit ouar, like many of the other pupils would have been. Would, would have been a, a bit of a burr in his... As a reflection of, uh, of their rural and county heritage. Uh, I just throw that into the mix. Oh, that's fascinating, actually, if you think about it. You often think back, and it's a bit like they did uh, Shakespeare, didn't they? They did a whole series of Shakespeare in the original accent, which we all think is very yes, yes. posh, but it's very, very burry. Mm. Anyway, sorry. Um, and so, yes, he, uh, he, he bought a commission in the, in the, in the British Army. This For was the rank a, of Cornet. Cornet. Uh, uh, yes, he was, uh, he was gazetted Cornet to the... Lance... The oh, the dragoons was it not light dragoons the, light dragoons the light the, yeah. light, the light dragoons um, which dra cost about it cost about eight hundred quid back then uh, oh uh, um, that would have been about sixty grand today which actually I don't think is too bad no it's <laughs> this, I suppose this, it was all relative but this was long before <laughs> the, before the Cardwell reforms of the eighteen sixties. When, when officers were promoted more on merit. Indeed, when in, you, couldn't, you could no longer purchase a commission and they got rid of half the ranks. Indeed. And probably in, half the revenue with it. Uh, it well, absolutely. Uh, of course, in Hawker's day, um, it, it was the depth of your parents' purse or the purse that you inherited depended at what rank you bought yourself into the army. Um, uh, Hawker came from a, a, a long line of, of military men. Um, he reckoned that his ancestors had been servants of the crown in a military context back until the uh, early 1600s. Again, one, one of my reasons for um, having a particular interest in him is that his grandfather was the, um, is, it, is it Lord Lieutenant? No, tell a lie, he was the governor of Portsmouth. Really? Um, and as a consequence of that and, and other things that we'll come on to, Hawker himself was a regular visitor to, to, to Portsmouth, um, which must have been intriguing for him, given Portsmouth's history at the time, which was something of a sink. 
particularly... Oh, whereas uh, now it is a shining beacon, an example of society. In, indeed it is. Um, the, the area around the point in Old Portsmouth was notorious for drunkenness, prostitution and open fornicating. I think it's changed a bit and that's probably mostly on a Saturday night now instead of seven days a week. But that, that, that was part of the sort of, um, uh, of the background. It, he, in his military career, um, and for, for, for anyone who's ever served in the military, bad enough in, in the modern sense, when you know someone shooting live rounds at you, even though it might be that they are a considerable distance away. Much of the, of the fighting that Hawker did was in your face. Very much line infantry days, wasn't it? Was it was line infantry days. The, the enemy was 50 feet away or, or was at the end of your sword arm. Um, and uh, I, I sometimes think when you look towards the end of his life to some of the medical problems that he had um, and to some of the things that are attributed to him in a negative sort of way, I think today you would undoubtedly say that he suffered or was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. He'd, he'd seen some uh, hair curling sights. Yeah, well, I mean, he was at, well. He got shot at the Battle, Battle of Talavera, didn't he? Which yes, in itself was quite gruesome, really. Yes, I mean, the quite whether he he took a pistol ball, a musket ball, whether it was uh, whether it had sp it was partially spent in terms of its velocity. Uh, he was never that specific about his injury, but he, he, he was certainly shot in the thigh um, and he suffered from it for some years afterwards. Although, curiously, there was a long period when, when he didn't. So I, I think you can kind of glean from that that it was probably a significant flesh wound mm. r rather than the well, bone. Yeah, I think that oh, um, only in his diaries, and perhaps obviously there was plenty of misdiagnosis back then because medicine was so bad. I mean, in his diaries, when he got off of the Victory, which we've probably gone to, he got off in Torbay, I think, uh, diagnosed with a shattered hip, or whether that was I, probably I th just a. I think yes. I, I, again, there are there are elements that I'm not specifically aware of, but I'm thinking that, as you say, that's probably a misdiagnosis. I don't I don't remember. The connect Ryan, could they? <laughs> well, no, indeed they couldn't. Um, and uh, I, you, I don't know if you've ever seen any. I mean, high velocity wounds um, in this day and age are bad enough. But the mess caused by a, a, a French musket at 50 yards would have been with, rather with a huge ball at relatively low velocity just ploughing through. Yeah, ripping through as opposed yes. to... Yes. Yeah. It's not really bad thinking about it, actually. It, it doesn't. Um, he, uh, he was invalided out of, the, uh, out of the army, given a small pension. Well, he tried to go back, didn't he? And, and Three times, four times, he it, tried to go back to Portugal yes. after he was put on leave. So he was brought back after he was shot and he tried to go back four times, yeah. um, which I found fascinating. I mean, that man must have been brave or stupid or maybe just I, I peer pressure. I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I think it was, I, I think again, we sometimes have um, a, a very different view about the human life and its value between now and the early 1800s. Hawker would have grown up seeing people in London at the side of the road who were in the last stages of starvation. They were literally dying of starvation. After the, um, at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, the, 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 the streets were often full of wounded veterans, uh, again in the last stages of starvation. And when you look at the style of combat that he would have been used to, people's life expectancy was significantly yeah. less. Well, they didn't have half of the medicine and things we had today. So even on a day-to-day no. -day non-war basis, people died a lot more than they do now. Absolutely. Um, something like, I forget the exact figure, but a good 50% of children died before they were four years old. Oh, Jesus. Um, and, and I think when you kind of look across history, the effect that that had on, on, a, on a fighting man of his age was very much one of if, if I throw myself at this and I survive, I can capitalise on it in okay, terms plenty of, of glory. Plenty of glory. If I die, well, and, and if you die, well, there I've you outlived go. five of my brothers anyway. Exactly, and, you, and you're going to die at some point, probably horribly, given the state of medicine. One might as well enjoy oneself. And yeah, let's go for it now and, and reap the rewards, be they death or glory. So, he 
to, to, to cut a long story short, uh, in, in terms of we should probably just step back very quickly, that he became captain at like just before he was 18 as well. Yes, he, was, he, he, was, he was promoted or purchased his promotion, mm. offered the chance of promotion to purchase, which I always find kind of strange. Yeah. Uh, very, very quickly for his age, extremely yes. quickly for his age. But he does also comment that he thinks he paid more. Or, or significantly more for it than <laughs> anyone else ever would. Yes. <laughs> but 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 uh, he, he he got it, and I mean this is not a comprehensive. Uh, overview of his military c career, which is kind of fascinating in itself. Um, my particular interest in him uh, uh, as, as a wildfowler is, is is after his military career is finished. I don't know if there's any other observations you had on his time in the army. Um, no, not really. Oh, well, actually, that's a lie. So, I, and I said I found it, found it fascinating because there is a, a largest section. Once he was shot, he was brought back, and he tried going back twice. Uh, he he actually got. No, he got, tried going back twice and got rebuffed. He then got on the Victory to go back. He found a place, I think, in a broom cupboard. To, the Victory was apparently like four times capacity or something. Yeah. And they got just out to the water and sustained damage in a storm. So they pulled into Torbay, uh, where he was brought off because he was fainting and sick and he'd got probably what we'd know today as septicemia. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, was bad, so he was brought off then. And eventually he managed to get passage back and like another few months later, and throughout this entire time he was still shooting, we'll probably talk about his diaries in a minute, which are, again, fascinating. He eventually got back and I think he lasted three and a half weeks before they said, go home. Yeah. Um, and before I stop talking about this, because it is awesome, and I shall read it off my computer because I didn't know, well, I can't remember that much. On the way back, there's a whole section about how they spot a turtle over the side of the boat. They catch the said turtle, and it's left up to him being the the most the most accomplished sportsman out of all of them uh, in terms of perhaps game cooking or game knowledge to cook it. And in fact, we won't put it now, but we'll put it right at the end. The recipe for Hawker's turtle soup, which I think is a beautiful insight into history more yes. than anything. And I find that kind of day-to-day -day life from back then utterly fascinating because. I mean, you wouldn't think about it now. No. Uh, anyway, I know, I'll now I'll shut up and we'll talk about his diaries. <laughs> Throughout his life, he kept a, a diary which was in the form, or its current, it ended up being some 20 odd volumes, yay sort of size, a size that would have comfortably fitted in a Mac pocket in a, yeah. in a <clears throat> excuse me, in, in a, either a uniform or the clothing that, uh, that, that he was wearing. And he wrote it practically every day. <clears throat> excuse me. One of the things to remember, of course, is that this was a very personal series of recollections and it was never intended to be published in the, in the form that it was written. Um, and I, I wonder if it's perhaps worth dealing with this issue in relation to Hawker's diaries now. A couple of things, sorry, they come randomly. The, the diaries themselves still exist. Um, they are in um, the library of a large American university. Um, you can still get access to them, and I do in fact have uh, some copies of, of, of some of the dates, um, which is connected with a, a, a research project to do with something else slightly different, still Hawker and shooting. Um, the, one of the first things that you notice is that the previous published material, which is two sets of diaries in particular, one was written by Sir Ralph Payne Galway, more of that later, and the second was a book that was edited by Eric Parker. Now, <clears throat> Payne Galway had access to a copy of Hawker's original diaries. Nice. So, what he was uh, reading... What sort of date are we talking about now? Um, I th uh, off the top of my head, I think that Payne Galway's um, uh, um, go at his diaries was 18, late 1880s, uh, early 1890s. I really can't remember. Um, but what he did was uh, kind of almost unforgivable. He edited the entries in order to make Hawker look like a boastful idiot. And if you read the original entries... And this was more, more than likely to make himself look better as a sportsman, I one would presume? I suspect it was. Uh, Hawker, at that stage, Hawker died in 1853, 
Um, and he wrote a book, uh, it's Instructions to Young he did Sportsman. indeed interesting to do. He also wrote one on his military career, but he didn't put his name to it. Yeah. Um, until until a few years before his death, actually. Yes. Now we move on. His his instructions uh, book ran to nine editions. It's still one of the most published and most widely read uh, sporting books to this day. Um, as was often said at the time, literally every country house in England had a copy of it in, in its library. It was groundbreaking. <clears throat> uh, for those of you who haven't read it, it's worth mentioning that essentially it is instructions from everything from how to pick flint for a flint lock, mm. how to use a percussion lock, how to shoot with a shotgun, how to load, uh, a huge amount on punk gunning, uh, and anything you could ever want to know about shooting from 200 years ago. Yes. It was the YouTube of its day, essentially. Absolutely. You can learn anything you want, and if you want to get into older guns, it's pretty much from what I saw and I've read of it, it's probably the first place to start. Yeah, it, it's a lot of the information still holds good today. So Hawker was kind of on this pedestal of, of authority. And along came Payne Galway, who was also a keen punt gunner. And, and I, I hate to say this, but I think Payne Galway rather wanted to try and displace him from his, from his perch, so and to speak. And put himself somewhere. And put himself yes. uh, perhaps higher in the order of things than, than he really was. Um, Hawker was in at the birth of of punt gunning. He didn't invent it, he's often he's credited with being the father of wild fowling, but Hawker himself never ever said, I invented punt gunning. Punt gunning that was, was something that was already going when he became interested in it. Because of his relative wealth and the fact that he could just go out and commission a punt, which would have been you know, an expensive thing to buy, to experiment with his, uh, with his design changes, meant that he brought certain aspects of that on a lot quicker than would have been the case. But it was not an idea that he dreamed up. It was something that was going on uh, around the coast around him. Again, it's just, just by proxy of his station, the fact that he was in a position to do all those things, also in a position that he would publish his diaries or sections yes. thereof in the Times and things like that, means that it's somebody using their fame to popularise a non-popular thing, right? Yeah. It, it happens nowadays, happens all the time, and I suppose the purists will say that he didn't deserve it, or perhaps he... He didn't earn that accolade, but of course he did. Why not? I, I, I think he, again, only because things are different. You, what you've got to remember in the 1820s and 1830s, one of the worst things apart from hunger that people suffered from was boredom. There was literally, you know, if you lived in the country and you've got no television, you've got nothing electric. No, no lights, no, no lights. nothing. When, when the sun goes down, it's the dark. The winter would be a very long, yes, so very dull place. Something like shooting, which certain elements of it were quite convivial. They involved meeting with other people. It was a great social event. Or at the other extreme, you've got wild fowling, which in those days was often done with commercial gain at the end of it. You can see that it was actually quite an attractive proposition. Yeah. And, it, and it made good reading for, uh, for, for, the, for the readers of the Times who although they lived in London at that time, Probably would, have would, owned would a not house. have been so far divorced with the reality yeah, yeah. of the countryside. So anyway, back to, back to Payne Galway. Payne Galway, I suspect, had evil thoughts about displacing Hawker because he knew at that time that Hawker's diaries, I can't remember whether the original diaries had been misplaced at that point in time, but he was pretty damn certain that nobody was ever going to see the, the, the original diaries and he took a chance and unfortunately because part of my research centers around that what's happened in the uh, in the various diary um, reprints with with subsequent heavy editing is that the dates of the events and the event itself have been transposed from the original diaries so so uh, Alan who we've met Alan Musselwhite um, uh, sent off um, and, and got some copies of particular dates that we had researched um, and, and found that they were ones that we wanted to look at and they don't correspond. Oh, wow. So it, it's, we're kind of back to... So his was somewhat abridged uh, and edited and moved around at, somewhat. At some point, the, um, the, 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 the dates from the original diary with, the, with initially Payne Galway's comments because again, what you have to remember, just to complicate it, that Eric Parker only had the edited notes from Payne Galway to work on. He, he too never saw the original diaries. Oh, wow. And yet, so he edited it. And edited. And edit. Yes. 
So, wh- so some what biblical in its terms that it has been edited by multiple people who have never still seen exactly. it or not seen it. Yeah. And and where I'm the, where I go with all that. Uh, who was Eric Parker? Sorry. Uh, he, he was a, a sportsman and writer in the in the 1920s who, who shared an interest with Hawker. Anything to do with Parker guns or? Uh, I don't believe so. But he did write. I think he wrote a number of books. He might have written for the Shooting Times. He was uh, in in his day. He was he was quite a well known okay. um, sort of you know shooting correspondent. Um, <clears throat> The, the upshot of that was when you read all the various edited diaries, it, it does make Hawker look a bit self-centred um, and, and completely alters the, the, the slant of his life. I don't think there's anything wrong with the diary being self-centred, even in that context, because if no one else is supposed to see it, there's nothing wrong with well, saying, no. I did this, I did that, and that is the, that is the very yeah. nature of a diary, I suppose. But, but, but where, where yeah. Payne Galway kind of went, to my thinking, just a fraction too far, was that... <clears throat> There's one classic passage where they go. I mean, this is a this is a concoction of a number of of, of entries. But Hawker went out shooting. Um, Hawker shot 20 brace of partridges. I never missed a single bird, and and I'm a, and I'm a hero. When you read the actual entry, it it reads: I went shooting with a host of my friends. There was at least 20 other people there, including my wife, who was also shooting. At the end of the day, the total bag was 20 pheasants, of which I shot three. And my shooting of the day, uh, you know, I, I, he, was, uh, he was often anxious to preserve his blank. He, he, he reckoned that he had almost no days when he didn't shoot something. Um, so in, in that sense, it's the difference between the, the, portray, the, truth. the portrayed in image yeah. and what actually happened. Um, and, and he was, um, I, I, I think that instead of being entirely self-centred and, and priggish, he was actually um, a, a, an excellent family man. Um, he had, I think, he did he have a son and uh, a daughter or two? I should know, but can't remember. Um, and, and much of the diary itself, his original diary, is is talking about the part that he plays in their in their upbringing. Um, and and you certainly get the uh, the the picture of, of a far more human person, the sort of chap that you'd like to spend time with. Sort of guy you'd invite out shooting yes. and quite happily spend and, time with. And, and the other thing which will have some resident, re- resonance for, for you and me is that Hawker was, he stood just over six foot tall. Oh, he was just a very in, tall man back there. In the 18, in the, in, up, up until his death in the, in the, in the uh, 1850s, he would have stood head and shoulders above your the, average, the, the, the rank, malnourished, the rank and file yeah. of, of his compatriots, um, and, uh, uh, and and certainly too, when you look at the, um, the, the the photographs of his of his face over a period of time from portraits that were taken, there's a couple of newspaper sketches of him, and you can you can see how he's how he's aged, but when you look at <clears throat> when you look at his at, at his old physog, he doesn't look like an unpleasant sort of bloke. He looks like the sort of chap that you could have quite a convivial afternoon with. But it's his, um, uh, and perhaps just sort of continuing on the, on, the, on the personality side of it, bearing in mind that he is a multi-millionaire, um, he, he owns land, he, he, has, he owns land in France, um, he's uh, heavily involved with, the, with London banking. He's on a fairly decent pension. He's, uh, he's, he gets he a, sold he gets, a very nice commission. Exactly. So th- this is a bloke for whom money is not an object. And he's shooting around Lymington Keyhaven, occasionally into Pool Harbour. And w- one, of the, uh, w- one of the world fowlers, bearing in mind Hawker, but by now, is, is a legend in his own lunchtime. He's, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a well known and quite famous person. And, and onto the scene comes a bloke called Sam Singer. Mm-hmm. And <coughs> Sam Singer is described by Hawker as being the veritable field marshal of the gunners of the Eastern Solent. Oh, well, the, wow. Eastern, the Eastern Solent is Portsmouth, Langston, yeah. and Chichester Harbour. <coughs> and, and I've done some research on Singer. Singer was born in Gosport. Um, I think he was a few years older than Hawker. When but Gosport was a village. When Gosport was a village. Um, it, it, it had the beginnings of its naval connections that it still has now. <coughs> but Singer was a waterman. Um, he, he made his living pr- probably um, from ferrying stuff out to to the naval ships they, yeah. they, they would have been you know five abreast uh, moored in the harbor the, the the royal navy 
had used contractors to move people and goods around rather than have its own boats. So <clears throat> he was one of those. He was exempt from the press gang and he got heavily into, this is Singer, into punt gunning uh, uh, around about its birth. Singer actually invented um, some of the um, some of the things that I would use, I would describe them as being characteristic of a south coast punt. M many of those features are significantly more m mechanically um, uh, efficient than the stuff that, that a little bit later Payne Galway poisoned the punt gunning market with, with, with some of his inferior ideas simply because he could afford to produce an extremely well interested book. You get the impression, I don't like Payne No, Galway. I was going to say, you're not a great fan. Not a great fan. So anyway, Singer is, a, is a, one of the better descriptions, a peasant. Yeah. Um, one of the people we were talking about last week with a gun that goes out to shoot for meat. Yes. Yeah, shoot but, for money. But he, he, his, his origins may have been humble. But like, like a lot of people, like with no money, he wasn't stupid. Um, and in fact, he was a very clever bloke. Um, not only did he uh, develop a punt gunning interest right the way along the south coast from Pagham Harbour, you can trace his movements from Pagham, Chichester, Langston, um, right the way backwards and forwards along the coast. Uh, he had a sailing boat um, and he, either, he usually towed a punt behind him. Occasionally it would be pulled up on deck, but he would travel as an itinerant wildfowler right the way along the south coast taking advantage of, of the birds in, in all the different harbours and the different environments. So um, the, the, the two of them meet in Pool Harbour and Hawker is, I won't say he's all over him, but Hawker recognises in him a kindred spirit and, and Hawker says that they, they sat there on, I think it was Hawker's boat, might have been Singer's, I can't remember which, but they had a conversation for over two hours about simply about wildfowling and and these are at opposite ends of the social scale but but Hawker was sufficiently open-minded and recognized in uh, in in Singer that that here, that here was someone who really knew what he was talking about um, and and was more than happy to give him time you, you can you can kind of imagine under different circumstances there would be lots of people of Hawker's um, status who wouldn't deign to speak to this peasant Hawker couldn't get enough of him became a very close friend with him uh, a quick digression on on Singer Singer I suspect was heavily involved in smuggling because he spent a lot of time apart from wildfowling he spent a lot of time in the harbours of the Solent which were completely unlit in those days in the dark so he should and, know his way around every creek and every well yes that's for sure but what Singer discovered, and if you think about this, I, I don't possess an example yet, although I'm looking to buy one. A compass rose is, is black and white pointy things, if, you know, on, the, on yeah. the face of the compass. If you look at that in the dark, you can't tell which way is north, particularly when you can't see around in front of your face. The Singer compass had the compass points on it, but one half was black and the other half was white. Which most compasses <coughs> are almost. But they're split colour today. Yes, yes, exactly. One, one half black, one half white. The, the net result of that was you could see the compass. You could you could find which way was north, south, east, and west in almost total darkness. The it was almost adopted by the navy. Um, didn't didn't quite make the cut, but nevertheless he made a lot of money out of patenting it and selling it until uh, he was robbed by, uh, by by a patent agent and basically lost all his money. Um, I, would you? Would, I mean, would have Hawker would have helped him along this sort of line of yes, this I'm, sort of thing? I presume helped raise him up to this. And I'm quite certain that Hawker played a significant part in in dealing with the patent agents and and the rest of it. I'll, I'll leave Singer alone there for a minute. Um, Hawker, um, we, we, if we look at some of the uh, of the things that that uh, that he did running parallel to um, his, his ordinary life, so to speak, if we look at his involvement with guns. One of the um, one of the guns which he is most closely associated with is the gun that he mentions in his instructions book, which is his double-barreled two and a quarter pound muzzle loading would have been muzzle loading in those days. One barrel flint, other way around. One barrel percussion, one barrel flint. Oh wow! The idea being, when he designed it, that the flint ignition would be slower than the percussion. 
the percussion the charge would hit them on the water as the barrel raised on the recoil the flintlock would ignite and catch the birds as they rose didn't, uh, didn't actually work quite like that in one practice. of the things that makes you feel really good a bit like putting two different cartridges in when you're game shooting this yes. is for my higher yes. birds and this is yes. for my low birds sort it, of thing it, in in practice it, it wasn't entirely successful he did have some good shots with it um but but generally speaking it was not an even though uh, to digress for a moment Payne Galway copied him by having a double barreled breech loading gun made by Holland and Holland um, th that didn't work either really I saw one of them at the shooting show yeah. a Holland Holland breech loading yes. gun that was quite exciting yeah well Hawker's gun was built by uh, Egg Der's Egg yeah um, it was great gun maker in his own right absolutely it was forged by Fullard in Clerkenwell in London and because Hawker was working towards perfection when you look at the original gun which still exists at Basque headquarters you can see it's had dozens of alterations as they found that well that doesn't work so I'll get it changed and it was worked on by Manton or, or mo most of the, of the big most of the London gun trade yes. at the time and and certainly by uh, Joseph Clayton from uh, from Lymington latterly Southampton Clayton was one of the few gun makers who actually grew up alongside punt guns and probably played a significant part in their technical development. If you look at punt guns by many other makers, they're rubbish. They, they, the, the gun maker has known nothing about what they're aiming for. Someone said, can you make a... Big long gun. You yeah, know, a 60 yeah. inch long, let's say 80 inch long thing tube with an inch and a quarter bore that I can shoot stuff with. Yeah, Clayton, because Hawker could practically pull up on the key outside of his job kind this of thing. This is crap. This, this doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, there is some suggestion that Clayton himself may also have been an exponent of it. When you see a Clayton gun and you know what you're looking at, it's sheer perfection in, in muzzle-loading uh, punt gun terms. Almost impossible to improve Very likely that he, he then used his own tool sort of thing. So Well, he, he worked on Hawker's gun. Um, uh, with, with some of the minor alterations, which, which is why I say it was, you talk about Frankenstein's gun, um, th this Hawker's big double gun was worked on by every Tom, Dick and Harry in the gun train. And, and when you actually look at it, they've, they've all, they're all uh, uh, very professional. There's no, there's no rough work on it at all. It's all very nice. Um, Clayton capitalised on the work that he'd done on it and the, and the time that he'd spent looking at the gun by producing at least two copies of it, one of, one of which is, is still in existence, but the copies w were by then perfected. They didn't have all the mistakes that the originals got. So uh, if you ever see one of the Clayton copies of Hawker's punt gun, it, it is a gun making tour de force. It is a, an astonishing piece of gun making. Where, where is it now? Um, the, the one that I know of belongs to a chap who lives in Wales. Oh, very nice. Um, but again, Still in use. I think that it might get the odd run out once in a blue moon. Right. Deserves it. Indeed it does. Um, so uh, Hawker is forever synonymous with that gun. Um, he had a bet with, was it Manton or Egg? Perhaps it was Egg. Over the final cost of the gun. He flipped a coin for it. I think it is, he's in his diaries of yes. Egg. And yes, and Egg, Egg said I want, you know, so and so. And Hawker said, well, throw in the ramrod and the box that it comes in and I'll give you whatever and he tossed the coin and Hawker won so he paid something like £225 for it which in, in today's terms is probably the best About part twenty-five grand. Oh, or it's near a quarter of a million in, really? in purchasing terms £250 um, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the early 1830s I can't remember the exact year that it was made we're going to take a quick break I'm going to check that because we've got a yeah. whole lap I'm just out of utter fascination all right break over and you've just missed a very fascinating conversation uh, the direct inflation on it would make it 22,000 pounds however Nick put it probably vastly more intelligently than I could ever do and said that yes it might have been worth 22,000 pounds of today but what you could have bought for 22,000 pounds of today back then what else you could have bought for that 225 pound mark back then it was the cost of a house Oh yeah, and and the rest. It, it would have been the, the 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 double gun when it was eventually finished um, would have been uh, a, a something of intense interest to anyone who saw it simply because of the cost. 
you know to to to, to have it on a on a punt he <coughs> excuse me what we haven't talked about is his cottage at Keyhaven. i was going to say because he, he Sorry, he, he he he. I thought he bought, but someone said he had built. Uh, uh, he bought it. I thought he did, and then didn't knock it down, but I think he extended it significantly. From what from, only from what I've read is, so he bought it and then put the builders in straight away to yeah. make it. One would presume a man of his stature, maybe buying more of a, a of a hovelesque cottage, might want it to be a little bit more reminiscent of yeah. a long parish house. Yeah, yes. it, it's an impose. It's still there. Um, it's an imposing next to the pub. F uh, four square building I would imagine it's got like four bedrooms with, with the usual um, living accommodation probably servants quarters somewhere um, at the time that the the immediate surroundings of it have changed somewhat <clears throat> but if you look at the illustrations of the time he could have rowed his punt up into um, a, a sort of a, the, the head of a bay almost which he had dug um, like you do. By hand. At one point, because of the way the tide worked, he was restricted in the times that he could get in and out of a particular creek system at Keyhaven. Wow, he had to. So, so he got all the local blokes of, of, for payment, a lot of, a lot of which of was in beer, day, yeah. in, in beer, to cut a channel which well, cut off Hawker's Channel, isn't it? which is known as Hawker Channel, and it cut off a big oxbow, which which meant that he could get in and out of the of the creek a couple of hours earlier. So that is dedication to your sport, or or at least obsession with your yes. sport, right there. And and of course, what he could have done, he would have pulled up in in his little um, parking bay, so to speak, and he could have got out of his punt, walked fifty yards across the road, and he was home. And in the early eighteen twenties, if you had money, home with you know with servants to light fires, etc., etc. Uh, he would have walked into a very, very convivial environment. I, I don't want to say it out loud, but that's the life. <laughs> uh, absolutely, yes. You know, at, at the end of the day, Sam Singer went back to living on, on his boat, um, you know, which was, although he, I'm sure it would have been as comfortable as he could make it, but was still, you know, a bit like a caravan on the water in the middle of winter. Um, completely different kettle of fish. So the, did they stay friends the entire of their entirety of their lives? Oh, they did absolutely. Um, uh, Singer kind of comes and goes through um, uh, through Hawker's diaries, and that's one of the things that um, that it, it is my intention to try and track down is to see whether the whether the Payne Galway and Parker included references to Singer are in fact all of the references or whether there's more but as I say because of this transposition of dates we're, we're not much closer uh, what I can tell you is that Singer excuse me ended up um, as puntsman for um, uh, for a number of, of wealthy people um, a puntsman yeah, professional puntsman. He 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 took people punt gunning. Oh, um, uh, like a guide. Essentially, yes. Wow. He he would. Uh, you'd have presumably a, Hawker. Sorry, sorry for interrupting. I should really stop that. So I'm going to stop. No, no. Uh, presumably Hawker writing about the punting punt gunning in the Times would have popularised it enough that people like. Yes. He, so he may well. People, I guess, would not have paid to go punt gunning before. No. Uh, the, the one thing that he did do was to make it fashionable for gentlemen. Yes. This would have this would have been something al almost exclusively confined to the lower classes, and and it was Hawker's um, input that made it a, 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 a hobby worthy of a gentleman. Um, Singer ended up as the professional puntsman to a number of wealthy people. Sadly, as um, the interest in punt gunning. In, in that sense declined and his wealthy patrons um, fell by the wayside you know died or whatever he, he ended up living in in Scotland punting on one of the Scottish firths um, the, the last I say entry the last record I can find of him um, is, is by another sporting writer in I think it's the 18 is it the early 1870s don't don't quote me on that but he is by then he's a wreck of a man he's in his 70s a lifetime of hard physical graft in a in a salt environment in the middle of winter plus you know the the ups and downs of one minute being stressed of, 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 yeah. of a wealthy man and then being utterly skint um, he he was on his last legs um, interestingly the, the the one thing that we kind of still do now uh, 
sound daft in honour of, of, of Singer because what he did would have been quite common. Singer took cold plum pudding with him when he went out shooting, when, uh, uh, particularly at night, because it, it had a it had a fruit content it was it was uh, quick sugar long carbs perfect you've got it it stuck to your ribs um and it was very filling and he washed it down with grog which is navy rum with two parts water whatever it is you know it kind of really warms you up from the inside but without getting you legless drunk yeah so w w we occasionally you know have a bit of plum pudding and a and, and a tot of watered down navy rum just to sort of keep that tradition going. I like that. <clears throat> but um, back to Hawker, uh, I think we've mentioned previously, we've been talking about four bores. Hawker had uh, a, a number of guns commissioned by Joe Manton. Shoulder with, guns. Shoulder guns, yeah. yes, with, with whom he was a very, very close friend, um, including um, his five bore um, single barreled duck gun that he called Big Joe. Um, he, he had numerous other guns as well uh, and just as an aside what you've got to remember in those days was that cripple stopping the shooting of any wounded birds after you fired the punt gun today you might use a double barreled gun that, that you could reload quite quickly you might even use a pump action gun in those days initially they were shooting cripples with flintlocks and nuzzle loaders Ooh. so they might have actually might have carried two or two three, or three guns yeah so you got your six barrels to so that you could you could polish them off before they all got too far in hawker's case because he could afford to what he often did was to employ a man in what they call a following boat this this was a bloke who was a retainer in a punt like boat and his his job was to was to follow about half a mile behind not enough to spook the birds but immediately on the shot he would row like the clappers to catch up with the punt and he would have another two or three um, loaded guns loaded guns and what they, what we call a dip net which is like a landing net basically and he would help the the punt and its crew polish off the cripples so that they could retrieve them all all right there was a picture i saw uh, some a picture i'm not sure i can't remember what it was uh, called the cripple chase which that's i right. thought was absolutely fascinating yes yeah that again that's um that that's one of hawkers in fact you can see the um you can see the, the his man in the following boat um, uh, coming up behind him um, and there was a couple of other things I was going to say the, the fact of the matter is of course is that H Hawker is a one of those facets of wildfowling like so much of it which you can go into almost ad infinitum there's yeah. lots and lots of connecting um, uh, parts of it um, the the, the 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 one thing that always was slightly disappointing was that he died about 18 months before the photographic process was perfected, was perfected yeah. o otherwise we, we'd have had photographs of, of Hawker we, we missed it by a hair's breadth um, fascinating bloke not the ogre and you know self-important chinless twit that he's sometimes portrayed as a, a very genuine human being um, because what we what we haven't touched upon is his interest in music. Um, he really? was a, he was a very keen musician, very capable musician. Um, he he entertained some of the top composers of the day at his at his home at Long Parish. He invented something called hand moulds, which are which were like wooden um, formers, so that when you're learning to play the piano, you knew exactly what the positions were. Um, you know, for any given. Uh, selection of notes. I don't, wow. play, I don't play the piano, um, but that's the gist of it. Um, and that was something that he that he patent, patented. And and his his interest in music um, is a no is another whole uh, aspect of his history that I've I've just never looked at because it's not. I won't say it doesn't interest me, but it's nowhere near as interesting to me as other parts. But it it nevertheless exists. Um, just as a um, as we kind of get draw towards a conclusion, his great grandson carried on the the military tradition. Um, he uh, he enlisted in the British Army. His, his great grandson, um, who was 
obviously his surname was Hawker. Do you know, for the sake of the argument, I can't remember his Christian name. He, he joined the army, very soon transferred to what was then the Royal Flying Corps, um, and won a VC for his exploits in the air. In, in, in the early part of the First World War, you know, when they were flying in, you know, virtually buckets. powered kites, you know, with buckets hanging beneath them. Um, you know, so that, that, that degree of um, almost disregard for personal safety continued genetically down his line, um, uh, uh, certainly as far as his great-grandson. Uh, Lano George Hawker. Lano, that's it, La yes. Lano George Hawker, uh, born 30th of December 1890, died 23rd of November 1916. So, a flying ace, as they were back then. Indeed. So, I know that's a bit of a nutshell, and it's kind of jumped around And will probably the continue forevermore. I think the real answer <laughs> is actually to get... See, I, from what you say about Payne Galway's book, uh, having that being the only Hawker's Diary thing I've ever read, yeah. I mean, perhaps I'm far too self-important to quite realise it in my own right, but I, I, di I didn't see it how you painted it, perhaps, until you said about what what's missing. Yes. Because, you know, I don't see a problem with a diary writing, shot this today, oh, yeah. didn't yeah. miss any. No. Because if, I've, if, if I'd done that, that's exactly what I'd write in my diary. Yeah. One thing that's worth saying is there are hundreds of entries of death and hundreds of entries of stories and hundreds of entries of had a bad day this is my excuse sort of thing and I think in total what 17,000 head of game documented in the book or something yes he uh, uh, I mean again that's another interesting um, story associated with that when you read the transcribed version of Hawker's notes of his diary what you read in the main are the results of his shots particularly at, at Widgeon and Brent Geese mm -hmm. which are something like a, a, over a thousand Brent Geese recorded in the book uh, I've yeah I've, I've got I've I've got the numbers somewhere and I'm blowed if I can remember them off the top of my head however when you read his original notes you'll also realize that he did what the gunners did in those days which was if there were no Brent Geese available that they'd shoot the Dunlin they'd shoot the oh, retro, everything a, a big stand of curlew you know much of which oh was, he's very derogatory about curlew actually isn't he which I find hilarious from our point of view uh, they uh, of course one of the things with curlew is that like the red shank they are like an alarm on the marsh curlew stood on the side of a channel you've got big long legs sees everything he can see right into the punt and if you've got a curlew stood on the edge of a channel and a shot at Widgeon beyond it you got the devil's own job to get past that curlew because if the, per the curlew goes he's going to start shouting the odds and the widgeon will go with it so th that's one of the reasons i suspect that he, he was not too keen on them <laughs> but um uh, you know they, they shot anything it was sold there is the, the, the frontispiece and would he have sold them yes the frontispiece for no reason other than money just well they're worth money they, they, they even to worth, a man of that stature absolutely well look at it this way funds a hobby Precisely. Uh, one of the, the frontispiece of his, uh, one, of, one of the books, I can't remember which one, is something like Returning to Keyhaven. And you've got two of his punts. One is a, is a big punt called the Lion, um, and the other is one of his smaller double-handed punts. Do his punts still exist? Uh, not the punts, to the best of my knowledge. I, I a bit suspect old now, to they, be fair. They would, they've, they've gone home a long time, and they weren't... The because, victory's still around, though. Uh, yeah, a bit more substantially built, though. <laughs> Um, and, and most of the victory, strangely enough, isn't original. Isn't original either. No. A bit like Salisbury Cathedral. Uh, indeed. Yeah. Um, but if you if you look at the picture, you'll you can you'll see a, num a number of things. It's worth perhaps trying to find it at some point on the on the yeah. internet. You've you've got Hawkers coming ashore. He's stood in the back of the punt. The, the, the puntsman is just making the last few strokes to the to the hard standing, and stood on the left is the Higgler, which was a bloke with a horse and cart who, from the local village who came down to take all the wildfowl off him and to take them to market. So, b because he always knew roughly the time that he'd be coming back, he would have contacted the, the, the Higgler to say, right, I shall be back at three o'clock on Thursday afternoon, you know, all things being equal, sit in the pub for a while, when you see me pull up, come out with your horse and cart, and you can take the birds to market. So, you know, that, that, that kind of thing was sorted, that would have paid for the Higgler's services, and any other monies that he made would have gone towards paying for his puntsman. 
So the, the, the whole thing was kind of self-sustaining. Well, I mean, nowadays we've got the beauty you can see timetables of tides, timetables of the sun, everything. And, and from what you're saying, you can even we can, we can see the weather. So you can see the Holy Trinity, put them together yeah. and go, it's worth going out today. Would they have no, read they, that or would they just gone out? I think, I mean, you know, common sense suggests that you can look into the distance and, and see the weather that's coming immediately. Um, there, there is still a bit of a science to uh, understanding weather in your local area in the absence of a weather forecast. Um, and it is very much area specific. Um, Hawker would have known what the tides were because th that was common knowledge. Yeah. Um, whether there were tide tables, there probably were. But I'm sure the Navy had something to do with Must have, uh, yeah. publishing a, a, a tide table, um, including the heights, etc., etc. Weather would have been a bit more of a stab in the dark. M one of my old punting mentors um, had absorbed a, a load of this weather lore from his grandfather, effectively. Um, and, and one of the things, like that, they used to shoot. They either used to shoot at night, or would often go out in the very early hours of the day, so that they were setting off in darkness. Just as a for instance, uh, on one of those, if you get a really flat, calm, still night, and you can see what looks like a ring around the moon, yeah, it's going to rain, and it does. Really? Yeah. And it, it is just guaranteed stuff, yeah, presumably to do with air yeah, pressure there's probably there's some science behind well, it more yeah, than likely moisture in the air etc et but it will rain probably you know within within 12 hours so uh, and, and i uh, and back then I, when I, they weren't so reliant on well, apple I, I, uh, I, I regret not paying more attention to the chap that told me some of this stuff because he had absorbed a whole load of of, of that kind of wild fouling law relating to the weather from a distant relative of his who would have been a contemporary of singers. So it was a direct window back into the time of, of Hawker. And, and, and sadly, I didn't realize it at the time, which is, which is why some of it went in one ear and out the other. But it's, it, they, they, they kind of knew pretty much what they were doing. Um, and, and also the, the, the punts that Hawker originally started to use would have been regarded as battleships today. They were big strongly built high-sided punts they, they they were if, if you like that they accepted that weather prediction was not the exact science that it might be today and that you perhaps stood a chance of getting caught out in some rough weather so because there, were, well, there wasn't much you can do about it if you did get caught out they made sure that the punt that they were in was capable of surviving it that's absolutely fascinating yes sadly I could <laughs> drone on about that for <laughs> forever but um, uh, ba back to Hawker momentarily um, have we done the worst of that to death I, I mean it's probably worth touching on not entirely his wild family was military he was a great game shot as well yes um, shot lots of pheasants and lots of part well not pheasants partridges to be fair back yep. then more than anything and, and of course uh, he was also a great dog man indeed um, he had a dog uh, his, his favorite dog was called Nero and from the pictures of it, because again we touched on this, you had the two types of what we would now recognise as either the smaller type, the St John's dog would have been the um, the, the, well, the, the Labrador, oh, yeah. and the it was, it was it was usually the lesser or the greater St John's dog or, or Newfoundland. The larger one would have been what we know today as the Newfoundland. These were being brought in from from North America, from, oh, yeah. from Newfoundland and the Chesapeake Bay area into Pool Harbour. So he would have got a locally bred dog, um, which was a direct continuation of that, that, that early importation of what are now, as I say, Labradors and Newfoundlands. The type that he favoured was looked, looked from the drawing more like a Newfoundland than a Labrador, although it would have been slightly Big, smaller. Strong dogs. Big, strong dog. Not quite the size of, of, of the They've been bred into today. Yes, I mean, they're huge today. Like a very large lab. Uh, like a big, well, uh, again, it would have been more of a, for want of a better description, it would look a bit more like a flat coat yeah. than, than it would uh, a Newfoundland. Because again, what you have to remember, if we digress just for a second on dogs, as a for instance, the Labrador that won Crafts in 1910, its father was a flat coat. 
So the, at, at that, that far back, the breeds were all kind of interchangeable. Yeah. And it was only, it's only now that we've become obsessed with... We've really narrowed them into some very strange looking creatures by yes. comparison. Yeah, so uh, Hawker was a keen dog man. Um, uh, did you take a, would you have taken a dog out on the water with him in this follow-up boat, or was uh, water retrieving not a thing? Occasionally, I think he may well have done. Uh, it, it's the simple practicalities of keeping a, of having, yeah. having a dog. Probably cheaper to have a person back it, then anyway. It's, yes, it, it would have been more trouble than it was worth. But, it, but he certainly uh, uh, had a great deal of affection for his dog, which by all accounts was, was pretty well trained. Um, dog training in those days I suspect was probably a little bit more brutal than it might be today because I think few understood some of the behavioural science that you might apply to, to training a dog but nevertheless uh, his dog seemed quite happy. It picked um, up some birds and, and, and yes and it, and it did what he wanted. So see, there's a I mean it pointed as well from some of the things I mean he doesn't have a call at pointing but they, uh, I mean, pointers in, in in those days would have been the, the dog of the of the stubble. Yeah. Um, setters perhaps less so, but you would have had people who perhaps had pointers who didn't themselves shoot at all. They would have hired themselves and their dogs out yeah. for, 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 for visiting sportsmen, so that they could have concentrated entirely on the dog and the bag, and they would have been in a in a sort of parallel universe, they'd have been a bit like the pickers up on a modern yeah. driven pheasant shoot. Oh, very good, very good. Um, I should stretch my back out now, actually. Yeah. I've really stand, stood at the slouch <laughs> too long. Uh, what haven't we talked about very briefly? Um, we've done wild fowling, we've done punk gunning, we've done his military career, um, we've done his progeny. We've looked at his musical involvement um, he, he was um, y you have to remember too in those days that patronage was everything you got further in life if you had someone in high places who looked after your interest so he kissed the backside of um, uh, the Duke of Wellington who, who we fought under yeah um, probably knew the Duke of Wellington quite well because he ended up his military career as the as a lieutenant colonel in the in the North Hampshire um, militia. Mi militia. The High Sheriff of Hampshire or am I confusing that with someone else? I don't think he was... Something up there. I I'm probably just yes. making that up in my head. He, he, he certainly ended his days um, w with a significant place in the local in the local excuse me local militia to keep up that military um, connection. It's a nice commission to have and all that. Yes, I, I don't know exactly what the um, what the rates of pay would have been, but I'm sure they, you know, he he covered his expenses, and I think he enjoyed doing it. But for anything else, I expect so. The problem is, I suppose once you've been out and done all the, about you see a lot of military men today, they they all miss it. Oh yeah, it, it's. I mean, he he talks about uh, occasionally uh, going out to Pennington or Keyhaven Marshes, uh, shooting with his shoulder gun, and it came in dark on a pitch black night. You couldn't see where he was going. And he, he he had his he was wearing his cloak, so he just pulled his cloak round him and and kipped the night under a hedge, which which of which he'd spent many months, if not years, of his doing. life doing yeah. a, a, a abroad on active service. And one more night wasn't going to bother him. He, he you know was he was a an you know, outward out bound kind of chap. Yeah, definitely, he was a tough old bird. Very much so. Uh, the, the last thing I wouldn't mind touching on, although I really don't know that much about it, I know he was involved more. He was also involved in the development of military farms as well. So I know he put forward patents for a uh, a musket of sorts, yes. an, an Enfield musket of sorts. Yeah. Um, that's about all I know about that. You might be able to expand. Um, the it, that, that that I think is a is a more specialist area. I, I only know that the more generic stuff, which was he he proposed a couple. He had built a um, uh, come on uh, a prototype yeah. of of the musket which contained his particular design features, which which was quite well received by the military. I, I'm blown if I know what they were or can remember. What, what I do know is that the the whole thing was not um, taken on in, in its entirety, but certain elements of yeah. it were precisely what they were. I can't Especially remember with, uh, some mild update or something, but I can't remember what it was. Yeah, I I, um, I can't either. But, uh, not that it matters that much. No. But just worth saying that he genuinely was. He, he loved it from start to finish, didn't he? Oh, yes. Uh, and was all about the betterment 
because I suppose, like you said, if you're bored, you might as well apply your time to something. Exactly, and and his um, his uh, his d development of guns. I mean, he uh, in his double gun, he illustrated where he was right on the cusp of the change from flint to percussion, because he had a gun built which had had both both ignition methods for the reason that we've just described. He, I think, absolutely loved technology, as was often the case in those days. That life was increasingly, the, the, the pace of change was beginning to, 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 to speed up. industrial revolution area. And oh, absolutely. Um, and, until we get to today, and often you'll find people, I don't know, they'll use, as I do, a side-by-side -side because it's seen as being more traditional. Yeah. Hawker would have given his right arm for a can of WD-40 and a semi-automatic shotgun. Well, I suppose, well, our, our main issue is there has been zero advancement I in the shotgun, uh, bar very minor things and, you know, and redesigns in the last 100 years. Yeah. We're just shy of, the last yeah. 80 years. Yeah. There's been nothing that exciting. Uh, variations on a theme, perhaps, and yeah, I mean, you could take certain things that are wonderful, uh, the inertia, uh, rotating bolt head on a semi-automatic, that's fascinating. Uh, inline hammers on a Blazer F3, that's fascinating. But it is all variations on the theme. Yeah. Uh, and so I suppose we, we're kind of bored or we're, 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 we're blessed and bored. Whereas back then you got to think over the course of 20 years, everything moved from a flint lock through about seven other locks to the modern day percussion lock. Yeah, and exactly. That in itself is, is pretty wild. Yes, and, and, he, and he was right up there with, uh, with the leaders in terms of not only embracing it, but helping to develop the, the technology, which again kind of forms the bedrock of what we do today. Which in itself is worthy of great praise. Indeed. The only thing that I didn't say earlier about his grandson that you brought up, he was killed by the Red Baron. Yes. I, Which, I was vaguely aware of that, but not until you reminded me. Yeah, no, yes. that's one of the little things I completely forgot. Uh, yeah, killed by the Red Baron, which is really not that exciting, but it, it's a damn interesting piece of information. Yes. Whilst we're talking about really damn interesting <laughs> pieces of information. Um, is there anything you'd like to say on Colonel uh, Peter Hawker himself? I, I think we've, we've scratched the surface, but if it's, if it's helped, particularly the, the younger viewers, in just kind of take, pulling the curtain of, of some of the past of the sport. I was going to say, we spoke much more about the broad sport than the man himself. But. Uh, exactly, but, it, but it's just to, to f f for people who are newcomers to the sport, just to give them an insight into the fact that this shooting has been going on for a very, very long time. Is it? We're not doing anything new or exciting, which no. is and, often and, quite sad. And, and, and more importantly, in, in, particularly in this day and age, uh, and, and I think you can you can, if you're not careful, end up with a bit of a siege mentality, which is we're not doing anything wrong either. No, so, no. So, you know, if, if when, when somebody criticises what you do, rip their heads off. Well, politely. Metaphorically right. speaking. Yeah. Well, I think there's, there's um, actually, whilst doing a lot of research for, for this before we spoke about doing it uh, together, actually, uh, one website I saw on him I think it was New Forest Life website or something, was to utterly scathing of him. I mean, you know, the barbaric sport of killing birds was acceptable back then, and I just wanted to put a comment on it, but there was nowhere to put a comment then, yep. the email address, and it says, and it's still perfectly acceptable and goes on today in exactly yes. the same harbours that you speak about with him. Yeah. Uh, we're just a significantly more quiet now. Yeah, it's, it's, it's much more controlled than it was, it's much more regulated, but, it, but it's, it still takes place. And as I said before, he, he laid the, ground, the groundwork for something which still continues to this day, and, and you know, for a, what what is what's gone from a um, from from a necessity, if you like, to something that is more of a sport of a sport, um, to to have assisted it in uh, in maintaining the level of priority that it still has to this day in the countryside. I think is a very significant achievement. I think so too. I think it's. Um one of those wonderful turning points in history, like you say, that took it, a bit like Manton took the, the gun of, mm. uh, of practicality and turned it into a gun of beauty, he took the sport of necessity and turned it into the sport that we still do today, and both, yes. of, both of those things are very dear to my heart, certainly. Yeah. And on that wonderful note, I think we're going to draw a conclusion for today's yes. chat. And if, I, if, if when um, 
I finished my researches into his diaries. If anything else more outstanding comes up, oh, I'm I'll always let you know. up for episode two. Always up for episode two. Uh, until the next time. Uh, actually, before we finish, turtle soup. Uh, you must take one turtle. Uh, this was in 1811. So an 1811 vintage turtle, and uh, you boil it with two cut onions, uh, a piece of butter half the size of an orange, mixed with flour, and a tablespoon of fine sugar, and the crust of burnt bread, and you boil that together. Boiling being, I'm hoping, was like a, a relative turn for simmering, perhaps. Because if you boiled it for two and a half hours, which he's asking you to, yeah. it's quite a long time, given this was on a boat. Yes. Um, No, so, so you've boiled the turtle for two and a half hours, and then you add those other ingredients, and then, sorry, you boil the above ingredients with it for an hour further in as twice as much water as would cover it. And then, add half a pint of Madeira, a small teaspoon of cayenne pepper, a tablespoon of anchovy essence, two tablespoons of Korach sauce, which I couldn't quite reference what that was, some allspice cloves, cinnamon peppercorns, and some pickled samphire, some capsicums, a juice of a whole lemon, and rind of half a lemon, and then boil it for two hours further. And then, <laughs> two more glasses of Madeira, and boil for a few more minutes before serving up. There you go. Well, I'll tell you what, I'd love to try it. If yes, it would have been tender, if nothing else. Possibly. If I'm very fishy and lemony. <laughs> but well, that was absolutely fascinating. I'd love to give it a go, but I've no idea what meat taste of turtle would be a good substitute for if we actually did it. Guys, thank you very much for watching. Nick, thank you very much. It's been an absolutely brilliant day and a fascinating chat about Hawker, of which I've been enlightened to some awesome things once again. I hope, more importantly, that you've enjoyed this and learned something. And I think we're actually going to release this as our first podcast as well as video. We're going to try that out for size. So thank you for watching, mate, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.